God, you can be seated this morning. Amen. Praise God. Well, listen, if, uh, if you weren't here, uh, whatever video announcements were going on, if you just made it in or if you're just now joining us on live stream, I want to say again, you got to be here next Sunday. You got to be here next Sunday for a huge, big announcement. Big announcement. Pastor Josh will be back, and he and Miss Jen have a huge announcement to make. But until then, uh, if it's all right with you this morning, I would like to share a, a very personal thing about myself. Um, I, I'm going to try my best to be a, as real and as open as possible because I feel like just about everyone in, in the room is going to be able to relate to, to what I'm talking about this morning. You've either experienced this uh, your, your whole life, you've experienced a little bit of it, you've had glimpses of it throughout your life, but I want to talk to you this morning about fear. Now, last week, uh, if you weren't here last week, if you hadn't listened to the podcast, you got to go back and, and listen to Pastor's message on living in peace. And I want to sort of piggyback off of that this morning and talk to you about fear and ultimately standing up to fear. But to do that, I want to tell you about my own personal struggle with fear. You see, I'm not going to talk to this morning about something that I read about in a book. This isn't something that I read an article or, or heard someone else's life experience, and now I'm going to share it and relay it to you. I have dealt with, struggled with, and battled fear my whole life. And I'm talking about, I know what it's like to be really afraid. I don't mean like someone jumped around the corner and scared you. And you ah. Now, I'm not talking about that kind of fear. I'm talking about the kind of fear that grips you. The fear that leaves you almost feeling paralyzed where you can't physically move. The, the fear where you're, you're sweating. Fear where one second you're hot, next second you're cold, and you don't know what's going on. You're just in fear. And, and to do that, I want to tell you about a time in my life that I, I spent 18 months believing God, praying and believing God to move in an area of my life that I needed Him to move in a bad, bad way. But I really want to focus on the first four months of this. Because the first four months, I was so gripped with fear that I could barely think straight. It, and some of you knew me during this time. You didn't know this was going on. And I'll get to that, the reasons why, but you didn't know this. And I was so gripped with fear. I was, I was driving down the road one day, and out of nowhere... Out of nowhere, the only way I know how to describe it, and if we have any doctors or nurses in here, look, forgive me for any terminology I used this morning. But I was driving down the road, and it was like a jackhammer just went off in my head. I, it didn't hurt, but it's, I mean, it was just going crazy. I freaked out. Never felt anything like this in my life. Next thing I know the whole right side of my body is doing. I was, I mean, you would be freaking out. Don't, don't act like you got it all together. That just happened out of, out of nowhere. And for four months, I would go to doctor after doctor, test after test, and it would, the fear would get so bad. Now, I, I know the word. I know God. I'm born again. I know what to do. But I'd never faced anything like this. This was new. And that fear was already a struggle in my life. Fear was already something that I constantly battled, that I was aware of. This wasn't new to me. I knew fear was real, and I knew I needed to fight it. I knew I needed to stand up to it. But I'd never had to stand up to it quite like this. And so for four months, I would go through these spouts where I, sometimes I would just be sitting there. I couldn't think. The only thing that's going on is the right side of my body is just, I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> you wouldn't have been able to see it because I wasn't physically moving. It was all internal. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it jumps to the left side and leaves the right side. And I'm going, are you kidding me? I'm over here trying to fight this battle. Now I've got to fight this one. For the first four months, I was gripped with fear. 
so bad. You know, the mind is such a, a weird thing, and forgive me if you're a medical anything, but the mind is such a funny thing. I was so gripped with fear that I would break out in sweats. I was so gripped with fear that my skin would begin to hurt. It would begin to burn. It was, I was so stressed by this fear. It was almost more than I, I thought I could take. And that went on for the first four months. Now, after that, like I said, it went on. The whole thing went on for 18 months. The doctors could never figure out what it was. They did test after test, and now I can stand in front of you really excited and say, they still don't know what it was, but it's gone, and I don't have to deal with it. So I'm really excited about that. Praise God. <laughs> but I know that this is a very real emotion. Fear is a real emotion. Sometimes fear can be a good thing. If you're afraid to jump off of a skyscraper to the ground, that is a good thing. If not, we need to talk after. But I know everyone in here, in some degree or the other, you've, you've faced this emotion. I know I'm not alone in this. I know you've faced fear. You've, you've had fear of, of rejection. You've had fear of, of missing out. Fear of, of losing a relationship. Fear of losing a job, fear of losing a kid, fear of your health, fear of finances. There's countless. We could probably talk about 200 different ways to look at fear this morning. You know, and sometimes fear can be a little sneaky. Sometimes, sometimes fear can be fear of your past. See, I don't want anyone to feel like you're excluded in this. this isn't, we're not just talking about things that go bump in the night this morning. Fear can be you're so afraid of your past what happened or what took place that you can't allow God to move in your life. For some of you, your fear might be you're so afraid that someone might take advantage of you, they might step on you or look down on you, that you're afraid to humble yourself before God and before people. And you can't live in humility. You, the fear is a sneaky, tricky thing. And there's all these different types of fear. You know, for me, I grew up in an environment of fear. You know, my parents were great. I love them. They love God. They believe in God. But this message, not everyone's aware of this message. Not everyone's aware of what we're going to talk about this morning. And I was raised in an environment of fear where fear was allowed. Maybe some of you were like that too. But I want to tell you, parents, we've got to protect our kids from this. And we'll see why in a minute, but we have got to protect our kids from fear. Now, my wife, I'm so proud of my wife. When I married my wife, I, I became her husband and her spider killer. That, that's what I did. She was afraid of spiders. And I'm looking at that going, you're in there, uh, okay, but I'll, I'll take care of them for you. But here's why I'm so proud of my wife. When we had our first child and she became old enough to act, see a spider and my wife decided, you know what? I'm no longer going to let this little spider scare me. I'm going to go deal with that little spider because I don't want my daughter to think you have to be afraid of these spiders. I was so proud of her. I thought that was a great approach to eliminate fear in her life and protect our kids. Then, th this is a funny one, we, uh, we started telling our daughter, every, anytime there was a thunderstorm, lightning, and we would hear, you know, the bang would come, we would tell our little girl, her name's Ainsley, when we'd hear the thunder, we'd throw our hands up in the air and go, thunder, thunder. If you saw me actually do that, you might laugh, but we started doing that with our toddler because we didn't want her to just be afraid just because there was a loud noise. The other day, when it was storming in town, there came a boom right by our house. I about jumped out of my shoes, and my little toddler goes, thunder. <laughs> oh, it was the cutest little thing. But that doesn't happen by accident. Now, for me, I've recognized that this is a real battle in my life. This isn't something that I've just all of a sudden I've conquered and now I don't deal with it. I actively fight against this because I don't want fear to rule in my life, and I don't want it to rule in my kid's life. But, you know, some, for some people, your fear might be you're so afraid of losing your kids as a friend that you won't speak truth into their life. You, you see where I'm getting with this fear? There's 
There's so many different ways that fear can sneak in and control your life. And for me in my story, fear got to the point where it was controlling my life. Fear began to tell me what I was going to do. Fear began to tell me, you're just going to sit there because you can't do anything about this for those first four months. But after that, I began to stand up to fear. I began to stand up to fear and say, that's it. I can't live like this anymore. I know better than to live like this anymore. And there's no reason that I should live like this in fear. I want to give you a few examples uh, before we go too far in this of the opposite of that, of what can be done with fear. And, and pose it in this question of when you have fear, when you face something that can be scary, that can bring fear into your life, when you have that, what are you feeding that fear? What are you speaking to that fear? What are you saying to that fear? Because in most cases, it's not the best thing. It's not the best approach. And in some cases, and the, the examples I'm going to give you, I did them. I, I'm not standing up here like I, I didn't do it. But Google. Google is the worst thing you can possibly do in your life. Google will make a grown man think he's eight months pregnant. Google will mess you up. This stuff was going on with me, and I started Googling. Oh, my gosh. My doctor was getting on. He, I was getting on his nerves. I would, look, I've got the, I don't know how to, how do you pronounce this? It will make you think, yeah, you're eight months pregnant. It, it is crazy. That's one of the worst things that a believer can do is start Googling. Wow, well, I got this symptom and this symptom and this. All right, let me, let me plug that in. And Google will mess you up in a bad way. In a bad, but listen, I did it. Do you know scary movies? Listen, I know as soon as I start talking about this, I know I'm going to get resistant. I know some of oh, there's nothing wrong with scary movies and scary TV. But I'm just going to tell you, this is wisdom. Scary movies, scary TV shows, these things, they produce fear in our lives. Now, you might say, oh, they don't scare me. Listen, Wisdom says you might think they don't scare you, but they are producing something in your life. They are speaking to your spirit, and they are feeding your spirit. I, about 10 years ago, I finally said, I can't, I can't do it anymore. I, I don't even remember the name, but I went to see this movie. It, I can't even tell you what it scared out of me. It, it, was, <laughs> it was so terrifying, and I said, that's it. I'm done, and I quit cold turkey. I am not watching scary movies. I'm not watching scary TV shows. I knew for me, I could not have that fear speaking into my life. I mean, I'm, I'm a manly man. I'm tough. But I couldn't have that speaking into my spirit, that fear. Fear, fear just constantly. I made it a point that I'm going to quit that. Now, another thing, and this is a big one, Facebook. Now, without, without just risking sounding too cheesy, I'm just going to say it. Facebook, and this is going to be cheesy, just get, get ready. But Facebook can become fear book. I know, I know. I knew it before I said it. But listen, I'll, I'll get on there and I'll, I'll see somebody. They, they put what's going on. And before you know it, someone's commented in, oh, yeah, I remember when... When, uh, when old Karen had that, oh, yeah, well, uh, what kind of flowers do you want? Because you ain't going to make it. I'm, why would you tell someone that? I, I see so many negative things put on Facebook. Somebody puts some, well, I'm going through this or I'm going through that. And instead of bringing them a word of encouragement, they, gotta, they feel like, oh, yeah, let me tell you about so-and-so that had that also. Oh, yeah, and I remember, you remember, ooh, that happened to me too, and this is how bad it was for me. And I'm going, oh, my gosh. If I had to read those comments about what was going on with me, that would only produce fear in my life. I don't put things on Facebook like that. If there's something going on with me, I've got a select few that's going to know about it. And when I was facing this, there was a select few that knew about it, that I knew they are not going to speak fear into my life. They are going to speak hope. They're going to speak encouragement. They're going to pray for me. But old fear book, it'll mess you up. 
I just want to encourage you that with this, this morning. If you're going through something, don't allow the enemy a doorway to speak fear into your life. Because I'm a firm believer in this. If God can't defeat you, he's going to try to defeat you through someone else's defeat. Did I say God? <laughs> the devil. Yeah, God's not looking to defeat you. I'm just checking to make sure y'all are paying attention this morning. Good thing, good thing. The devil, the enemy, y'all knew what I meant. The enemy, if he can't defeat you, he's going to try to defeat you through someone else's defeat. And let me just tell you, there's so many defeated people that are living in fear that don't know this message. They're living in fear, they're on Facebook, and they're just chopping at the bits. The second you put something's going on, I'm going through this, I'm going through that, that they can just jump on board and just feed that fear and feed that fear and feed that fear. You need to find those people for you, whoever those people are for you. Find those people that are going to encourage you, that are going to speak hope, that are going to pray for you. Those people that speak fear and they're negative, stay away from them. You know, eat with them, have fun with them, but don't, don't bring those things up to them. They don't need to know that. They don't need to know what you're walking through. They're not going to bring hope. They're not going to bring encouragement. They don't need to know those things. We can't feed our spirit. We can't speak to fear this negativity and, and more fear and more fear coming from defeated people. But I tell you what I do, and I'll, I'm going to tell you this morning how I overcame this fear and how I moved past it and how month five was a whole lot different than month four when I was walking through this. I did what David did. And I want to read one of the things that David says in Psalms 143. In Psalm 143, verse 5, David said, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you have done. I ponder the works of your hands. David said, I think about what you've done, God. I remember the days of old. I remember what you've done in my life. I meditate on your word. And Scripture is full of this. God's word is full of people, and, and David especially, and the Psalms are full of people saying, I'm going to meditate on the word of God. And I'm just going to tell you, this is what got me through. This is what broke the fear in my life over this situation. This is how I was able to function and to live, was I began to take this serious. I began to meditate on the word of God. I knew to do this. I knew I, I should do this. And I was praying and I was worshiping. I was doing all the things. But the moment I took this serious and I really got hold of it, and I said, I'm not going to put up with this fear anymore. I'm going to meditate on the Word of God. Now, don't misunderstand me. Prayer is extremely important. Worship is extremely important. I'm not excluding those this morning. But what I'm saying is I was able to meditate on God's Word all the time, nonstop, no matter where I was, I was able to meditate on God's Word. Now, if we go walking down the street, worshiping and praying all the time, people might look at us like we're funny. They might not understand why you're walking around Walmart with your hands raised or why you're, why you're talking to yourself. They're not going to understand all that. I can't, I can't walk around doing that, but I can walk around constantly meditating on the Word of God. I can walk around constantly thinking about what God's Word says about me nonstop. And I said, that's what I'm going to do. Nonstop. The second the enemy speaks something, the second fear tries to rise up in me, I'm going to combat it with the Word of God. I'm going to make sure I have enough of the Word of God inside of me that as soon as fear tries to grip me, I'm going to speak the Word of God to myself. I'm going to preach the Word of God to myself. That's one way of looking at meditation. Meditation is having the Word of God in you and having it in you so much that you're able to preach the Word of God to yourself. And you say it over and over and over. Sometimes I'll, I'll spend a, a week, a month, on one scripture just thinking about it. Just thinking about that one scripture. Sometimes I'll think about just a couple words, in Christ. I'll think about in Christ. I am in Christ. I am in Jesus Christ. And I'll just think about it. It's the Word of God and it's truth. And I'll just sit there and I'll think about it. And I'll think about it. And no one around me has any clue that I'm even thinking about it. 
but I'm just thinking about it. Thinking about the Word of God. I am in Christ. I am in Christ. I am in Christ. And as I began to do that daily, I began to break that fear. And when fear would try to creep up, it would break it. It would tell it no. No, that's not the truth in your life. God's Word is the truth. And as I began to meditate, it began to break that in my life. I want to read another scripture to you. This is one, if you go back and listen to last week's message, you'll, you'll hear Pastor talk about this one. This scripture was so true in my life. It's Philippians 4, verse 8. It says, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. You know, I told you I knew to meditate on the Word of God before this whole thing happened with me. One day I was, I was working at a church in Shreveport, and I was sitting out in my truck, and this guy, he was a guest minister, he walks up, and he walks up to me, and he was just going to pass by, and he stopped, and he looked at me, and he said, I, I thought it was strange, because I'd never met the guy, he just stopped, and he said, Philippians 4.8, Philippians 4.8. He said, you need to hang on to that word. Just hang on to it. I had no clue what he was talking about, why he was talking about it. But boy, I was about to need it. I was about to need that in my life. There were things going on that I knew after a while, once they were revealed, that I was going to need this word. And I had to begin to think, okay, if it's true, if it's pure, if, it, if it's reputable, if there's any praise in it at all, I've got to focus on these things. And I've got to think on these things. And that's one of the things that I began to do as I was facing this fear. I would have to think, okay, is, is this bringing glory to God or is it not? Okay, then I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to think about what brings glory to God. I'm going to think about what God's Word says is true. I'm going to meditate on it. I'm going to speak on it. I'm going to speak on it. I'm going to continue. I'm going to continue to preach to myself. I'm going to meditate on this Word and I'm going to preach to myself. You know, and you wonder, why is it so important? Why is it so important that we, that we meditate, that we preach to ourselves, that you become a preacher and preach to yourself? Why is it so important? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And so sometimes I'm just saying it in my head. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking the Word, but sometimes I just speak it. When I'm by myself, I'll just begin to speak the Word of God so that I can hear the Word of God. Because I believe this Scripture. I believe the Word of God says that faith comes by hearing the Word of God. There, there, there's no other way. Scripture says faith comes by hearing the Word of God. So I can't hear someone else's story. I can't hear someone else's example. The story that I told you this morning, that's not necessarily going to produce faith in you. But the Word of God will. As the Word of God goes forth, it'll produce fruit. It'll produce faith in you. The Word of God, hearing the Word of God, produces faith in your life. And it's what it began to do in my life. As it began to produce fruit in my life, I was able to combat that fear. But you know, the opposite's true. The opposite's so true and just as powerful. As we begin to listen to other things, as we begin to feed our spirit other things, Instead of faith being produced, fear starts to be produced. At the beginning of my walk through this, I don't even know what you call it, because the doctors could never put a name on it, but I was listening to everything. I, I was listening to my own self, telling myself, oh, it, it must be this, it might be this, it could be this. And I was listening to that, listening to that. Let me give you an example. Finances is a big one. I would say health and finances are, are a huge thing that people would walk and live in fear and, and worry and concern. You know, if, if, if a couple was sitting around talking about their finances, worrying about the, what are we going to do? What do we, I don't know what to do. I don't know what the next step is. I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. How are we going to make it? How are we going to make it? If that's the only talk, you're producing fear in your life. If that's the only outcome of that conversation, whether you realize it or not, that is producing fear. Only talking about the concern, only talking about the worry. 
instead of have that conversation. Because, look, well, you've got to talk about your finances. I'm not saying don't sit around and talk about it. Don't balance your checkbook. I'm not saying that. And I'm saying when you have that conversation, end it with but. But I'm blessed, highly favored. End it with God will pour out a blessing upon us that we can't even fathom. We can't even measure. We can't even contain because I'm a giver. I'm a tither. Begin to speak that word over that conversation. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your needs according to, your, to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Next time you're in that conversation, figure it out, talk about it, and then end it with but. But my God shall supply all my needs. God's going to supply all our needs. Look, honey, sweetie, baby, whatever you call each other, we may not have the answer right now, but God's word says he's going to supply all our needs. We're a tither. We're a giver. We sow into his kingdom. Luke 6, 38, give and it'll be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So I don't know how we're going to do it. I don't know what the next step is, but we give. And God is going to give good measure back to us. We don't have the answer. We don't know exactly what to do, how to figure it out yet, but we are going to figure it out. The Bible says that we can ask for wisdom if we don't have wisdom. So if we're sitting around talking about we don't know what to do, we don't know what to do, but God's word says I can ask for wisdom and he's going to give it to me. Fear is so sneaky. It's so sneaky how it just jumps in there. You know, my wife is so good when it comes to health. Obviously, you heard that's where I struggle. My wife is so good. It doesn't matter. There's something going on. She's speaking the word, and she's telling me, and she's encouraging me, and I'm going, wow, I, I wish I had that. When it comes to finances, I'm like, whatever. God can do it. He has to. He must. He's going to. My faith is strong in finances. My wife's faith is strong in, in health. And so we just balance each other out a little bit. I'm, I'm having to give her some, some correction. She's having to give me some correction, and we're just help, helping each other out. And I'm so thankful for it because iron sharpens iron. She's not speaking fear to me. You better believe she was right there kicking my tail the whole time. She was loving me, but she was kicking my tail and speaking the word to me when I was going through that. You know, the Bible commands us. This isn't just a good idea. This isn't just a suggestion. But the Bible commands us to fear not. God tells us to fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Take heart. Take courage. Over and over and over. It's a command from God. You know, fear, fear tries to steal our peace. Fear, fear is after so many things. But fear is after our peace. And God is telling us, fear not, as a command. Even though fear comes in and it tries to steal your peace, fear not. Fear comes in and it, it begins to taunt you. It begins to point its finger at you and tell you you can't do it. You're not going to make it. You're not good enough. This is going to happen or that's going to happen. If you make this decision, everything's going to fall apart. You don't hurry up and do this. Fear begins to taunt, and it's what it was doing to me. Fear was taunting me, telling me what I couldn't do, what God wasn't going to do, what God couldn't do. Fear begins to taunt us, and it reminds me so much of the battle between David and Goliath. Most of us probably heard that story at some point in our life. David and Goliath. David goes out with a sling and a stone, hits the giant. You heard the story. But my favorite part of this story isn't so much the whole sling and the stone and the big guy and the little guy and all that. I like the back and forth banter. You ever read that? You read the, the back and forth banter between David and Goliath? I mean, there's some trash talk going on. This battle's going on. You've got the Philistines over here on this mountain. You've got the Israelites over here on this mountain. And Goliath walks out, and he starts taunting. He starts taunting the Israelites. And I want to read real quick what he has to say. Goliath, in 1 Samuel 17, verse 8, he, 
It says this, He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? You see, you see what he's saying there? Why are you even here? What are you even doing? Do you really? I'm a Philistine. How dare you come out here to me? And he says, choose a man for yourself. Now see, when I read that, he says, choose a man for yourself. See, I'm, as a man, I'm thinking, if I want to taunt and I really want to push the buttons, I, I'm questioning their manhood with this question. This isn't just a, send a man out, send a man. You got one? Are there any men? Are there any men in your in your tent? Any men in your army? I didn't think so. He's taunting them. Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him, he probably kind of give a little. Of course I will, and kill him. Then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Can you just see this big nine foot tall giant? His armor's 125 pounds. The Bible says that the spearhead on his spear was 15 pounds. This thing's huge. This guy's huge. And he's standing over Israel and he's taunting them. He's taunting them, kind of like what fear can do in our lives. He's taunting this army. And saying, I dare you. I dare you to send out a man, if you even have one. And look at their response. The army said, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This great army is so afraid of Goliath. I see this army gripped with fear, terrified, not knowing what to do, not sure what to do. But they were greatly afraid of this giant who's taunting them, who's telling them they can't do it, who's telling them they're not manly enough, they're not strong enough, they're not smart enough. Goliath's just taunting them, taunting them. For 40 days, he taunts them. He walks out there, and he taunts them, and he taunts them, and he ags them on. David hears about it, and you got to love David. you got to love David, the shepherd boy, who's not a trained military expert, he goes up to the king. He says, King, I'll take care of this. There's no problem. He says, listen, I've taken on lions. I've taken on bears. I grabbed them by the beard and struck them in the head and killed them. This giant will be nothing for me. You gotta love David. Listen to what happens though. David walks out to meet Goliath. And listen to this trash talk as Goliath begins to taunt David. He says, And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Goliath just did the same thing to David. David comes out, and Goliath begins to taunt him. Goliath begins to tell him what he can't do, how he's not strong enough. And then he took it a step further. He said, I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to feed your body to the birds. We don't tell the kids this part of the story, in case you were wondering. He's taunting David. David's response is my favorite part of the whole story. The part of him killing Goliath, that's all cool. But his response, listen to this. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and with a spear. You see, you got, you got to read into this story or you're going to miss it. Well, you come to me with a sword and a spear? Big deal. <laughs> Big deal. What are you going to do with that? David is trash talking in this moment. You've got to realize that. He's trash talking. This isn't cute little banter at this point. You come to me with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut your head off. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all the assembly may know that the Lord saves not with the sword and spear, 
for the battle is the Lord's. And he will give you into our hand. Forty days, Goliath's out there taunting. And finally, David said, that's enough. I've had enough. Basically said, shut up. Shut up. I can't take this anymore. I'm not going to listen to this anymore. And the second David walks out there and Goliath starts taunting him, he said, whoa, now let me tell you what I'm going to do to you. You've done enough talking. You've been talking for 40 days. You've done enough talking. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to feed you to the birds. How about that? What do you think of that, Goliath? You better, you better hang on. Get ready. And David takes off running with his sling, hits him right in the head, knocks him face down to the ground, walks up and takes his sword and cuts Goliath's head off. The Israelite army takes off and they pursue the Philistines and they, they slay them. I mean, this is just an incredible story. We leave the head cutting off part off for the kids too. We don't. Aren't you glad you're an adult? You get to hear the good stuff. What an incredible story. But that's, this is why I'm reminded of this story. Because that is what happened in my life with my giant fear. I had to finally say, enough is enough. I'm tired of listening to you. I'm tired of letting you tell me what I'm going to do, what my life is going to look like. Shut up. And I began to speak the word of God. I don't care what I'm feeling right now. I don't care what anyone thinks or what anyone says. I'm tired of fear dictating what my life is going to look like. I'm tired of fear dictating my relationships, dictating decisions that I'm making in my life. And I had to stand up to fear, and I took off after fear. You know, I don't think David, maybe he did, I'm just assuming at this point, I don't think he thought that one stone was just going to take Goliath out. Maybe he did. But when he was talking to Saul, he told him about the lion and the bear. He said, I took him by the beard. And I wrestled him down and I killed him. I think David was ready for anything. He was ready for battle at this moment. He was ready for action. And I'm telling you, this fear, if you, if you even remotely deal with fear like I do, you got to get ready for battle. And you got to take this thing head on. And you can't allow it to continue to taunt your life. You can't allow it to continue to tell you what you are and what you aren't going to do. I think David won that battle the second he stood up, the second he walked out there to Goliath, because the battle was God's. The battle was God's the whole time. The whole time. There's another king in the Bible, King Jehoshaphat. He gets a report that these armies are gathering around. Three different armies are going to wipe him out, annihilate him. So he gathers all the people, and he says, let's pray. Let's pray and let's fast. we got to find out. We, we need to know what to do. Is God with us? Is he going to save us? Is he going to help us? I'd be pretty terrified if three armies were trying to wipe me out. He gathers them up. They're praying, and one of the people in the crowd speaks out, says the battle is the Lord's. We need to go out. The battle is won by God. The battle is God's. And they walked out. There was a lookout point. They walked out, brought their army out. And when they got there, remember, three armies are wanting to wipe them out. They're lining up to attack them. When they got out to where they could see where the armies were, all they could see were dead bodies. All they could see were dead bodies. God caused those enemies to turn on each other. The only action Jehoshaphat and his men had to do was take a stand and believe in God. I am asking, I'm telling, I'm encouraging this morning. Take a stand against your fear. Whatever your fear might be, hopefully you're at the point, and hopefully I don't have to encourage you to get to the point where you're tired and frustrated of dealing with fear, of struggling with fear, of fear telling you what you're going to do. If you're fed up with fear, stand up to fear. Stand up to fear. Believe that God is going to win this battle, that God is going to lead you through it, and that through meditating on His Word and speaking that Word and speaking faith over and over into your life, it's going to break that fear off your life. It's going to move you past whatever you're going through, whatever that fear is currently in your life. Now, listen, don't, don't expect this to be a fix-all one time. I speak the Word one day and that's it. I'm telling you, I do this constantly. Something will rise up and I'll go, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have an opportunity to let fear tell me what to do 
or I can speak the word of God over this situation. It's a daily battle. Maybe it's not a daily battle for you. Maybe, maybe you're far more advanced than me, but fear, fear tries to sneak in. And I want to tell you this morning, this last thing I want to say, here's one of the most dangerous things about fear. Fear is so sneaky. Fear is so sneaky. You know, when I was going through my, my stuff and I was having tests and I was, I was so terrified to go get a, a test. They wanted to do a CT scan on my head and try to figure out what was going on. And I told myself, you know what? I, I'm, I'm standing in faith. I'm standing in faith. I don't need that test. I'm not going to get that test. And I kept telling myself that and telling myself that because I know you're supposed to stand in faith. I was praying one morning and the Holy Spirit spoke to me so clearly. Brandon, you're not living in faith. You're living in fear. You're terrified of what that test might tell you. <sighs> so I went and had that test. Came back negative, couldn't find anything, nothing wrong. And that, that act of obedience, that act of saying, you know what, you're right. I'm living in fear and I'm not going to allow it to dictate my life. It was that moment that broke it off my life. It, I was able to move past month four. And it would be several months until I was healed of whatever it was. But it was that act of obedience. Fear wants to steal our peace. Fear is after your hope. If fear can cause you to lose hope, it can begin to rob you of your faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. You've got to be hoping for something if you're going to put your faith in something. Fear is after our peace and it's after our hope. Let me say this, for us believers, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, you know from this series we've been in that we are called to reflect the light of God, to shine a light into a lost, dying, hurting world. But fear limits that. When fear sneaks in and it steals our hope, steals our faith, fear doesn't allow us to accurately reflect the glory of God. That was the most frustrating thing for me, was I knew if I allow fear to stay in my life, I can't accurately reflect the glory of God. But I begin to dilute it. And when people see God's glory reflecting off me, it's going to be a diluted version. It's going to be a watered down version of who God really is, of the hope that's really in God. And I can't allow that. We can't allow that. If you're facing fear, if you're dealing with fear, you need to stand up to it. Stand up to it. Say you've had enough. Don't allow fear to tell you what you're going to do in your life. Don't allow it to dilute the, the word of God in your life. Don't allow it to water down God's glory and ultimately what other people see. We are called to be a light to the world. We're called to show hope, faith. And it's okay to admit that we have struggles. It's okay to admit that we, we battle fear. But we can stand up to fear and begin to shine God's glory and shine a light and it be accurate 